I would like to bring up Steve Harrison, who is going to do a little bit of an introduction by our speakers this morning. As I said, I think you're going to really, really enjoy what you're going to see. So, but please feel free to keep eating, and we'll do our very best to uh, not interrupt that process. Thank you again for the indulgence. Like I said, we are kind of on a short time frame.
After Ray died, our father Bill found some papers in his files entitled Recollections of My Life for the Entertainment of My Grandchildren. Denny, that's me, by the way. And Judy, written in 1947. <clears throat> Ray says on the front page, just a few early day reminiscences to show some of them some of the conditions under which their ancestors lived. It has been my hope to compile an entire volume of early day stories, especially for Denny, who was always wanting his grandfather to tell, tell of the old days. <laughs> to eliminate our generational habit of saving and historically documenting things paper, this additional notation is found on the, the front page. Note, I found this on August 29, 1977, 17 years after father's death. In his papers, we were breaking up the old office at 12th and Cedar in Trenton. Inasmuch as there was but one copy, I made copies for Denny and Judy, and I'm putting the original in the files of the State Historical Society of Missouri, Columbia, signed William R. Gensler. Much of our data comes from these, these writings. <clears throat> It's now 134 years since our grandfather was born, 113 since he became a Mason, and launched a career. No, it was more than a career. It was a lifetime dedicated to writing, chronicling, mentoring, and fostering the sonic craft throughout Missouri, the U.S., and indeed the world, as you will see in the recently released Volume 2 of Ravy Denslow's Messiah Journey. Today, Judy and I will attempt to transport you back in time and give you an insight into Ray's youthful experiences and his pathway to adulthood that became a life dedicated to masonry. For the most part, we have taken these stories verbatim from Ray's written recollections, and we can hear our grandfather in these writings as they very much reflect his style of speech, sense of humor, and sense of propriety. Here are three generations of Denslow's at Ray Clare's 50th wedding anniversary in 1957. That's Judy and me. We, don't, we haven't changed, of course. <laughs> Next to Ray and Clara, uh, Juanita and Bill, that's our parents. And you can figure out Snoopy, Judy's beagle, on the, on the grass. <clears throat> Ray lived in an unusual and progressive time in the nation's history. During his life, he saw the advent of the automobile, the airplane, the radio, the television, inside toilets, running water, the telephone, paved roads, and four wars. Spanish-American, World Wars I and II, and the Korean. He was the first Denslow who did not live on a farm. His closest association to farming was when he lived in Spickard. His mother kept a few milk cows, and his duty was to drive them to pasture each night, or each day north, on a hill north of Spickard and return them at night. His grandfather's world was limited to the township, his father's to the state, but Ray's world was national and even international. He met kings, princes, potentates, presidents, and business tycoons. He became world-recognized authority of Freemasonry and wrote extensively on the topic. He was the only surviving child of William, Marvin, and Melinda Caroline Schooler Denslow. An infant daughter was born in 1882, surviving only two days. Ray was born in 1885, and the third child, Carl, was born in 1891 and died just shy of his fifth birthday. We might have guessed that Ray would become a recorder of history and events because, as a young child, he wrote the history of his own birth. He eventually, he had learned this from his mother and decided it was worth recording. Here is what he reported. Ray Vaughn Denslow was born on Thursday evening, March 6, 1885, at 10 o'clock in the evening, in a three-room house on the corner of Mason and Main Street, Spicker Desert. Present at the birth, Mrs. Wesley Brown, a neighbor, Mrs. Mary Case, a neighbor employed as a domestic, W.M. Denslow, the father, and Dr. James B. Wright, the attending physician. As a parenthetical, mom's not mentioned. <laughs> it, was, it was very cold weather at the time, and a little cloudy, but during the day it had thawed considerably. For the first three months, Ray caught, cried continually. After that time, however, he rarely cried. <laughs> From the year of his birth until 1885, from 1885 until he was a teenager of 14, the family lived in Spickard, Missouri. The Denslows seem to have been movers and shakers in this small rural town. For instance, Ray's father, William Marvin, was a member of the Missouri House of Representatives representing Grundy County. During his last term of 1895, Ray went with his father as a 10-year-old boy 
to be a page in the House of Representatives in Jefferson City. Ray records many remembrances of this experience. He was a small town boy in a big city. During this time, as a page, he met many important people in the state of government, including Governors William Joel Stone and Lon V. Stevens. Never in my life did I have such an educational experience. Here in a few weeks, I acquired more information about civil government than I have learned since. To me, the legislature became a living thing. And as an aside, recently I was with my grandson reading this section about Ray being a page, and since my grandson was the same age as Ray, I thought he might be interested in what he was doing. And I was trying to describe to him what a page did. I told him that Ray would be in the legislative chambers and would run papers of importance from one person to another. To which my grandson replied, why didn't they just text each other? <laughs> ah, you, huh? Despite being a small town, Spickard seemed to have its share of firsts. Ray had the first bicycle in town, bought with the money he earned as a page. The family had a phone, and Ray had a camera and a makeshift darkroom, probably because his father sometimes was in the photography business. Ray's dad was always curious about everything new and unusual. He grew interested in the telegraph, and thus the family had a telegraph in the house that was connected to the local telegraph office. They resided in the same house in Spickard from 1880 until 1899. Ray says, water came from the well. Every family had one. From this well, we had to retrieve the water with pumps. Water had to be carried to the kitchen from these pumps so that all might take a bath or for cooking purposes. When the water got low in the cistern, cistern, we had to haul it from the river. He continues, most everyone had a kitchen range and there was a stove for the living room. Both in my day were wood burners, necessitating the storing of cordwood, sawing it by hand, storing it in our summer kitchen or another dry place, then carrying it into the house on demand. The first stove I remember was a large one with the word Peoria on it in colored tile. The first word I ever learned to spell. My first recollection of life was the use of oil, coal, coil, coal oil lamps, which had superseded the candle. It required the daily cleaning of the chimney and the refilling of the oil reservoir. It had a wick which had to be trimmed daily and which extended down into the oil. Some of these lamps were very pretentious. We had one which was quite fancy and hung in the ceiling where it dispensed lights to all sections of the room. Most families had three or four of these lamps. Then there was the indispensable lantern, which had to be used for all outdoor chores after dark. Many a time, I had to milk a cow or feed the horse using a lantern for light. Next came the electric light. My first use of this was when we had, a, we had to move to Macon in 1899. We found the house wired for electricity, and ever after, we had electric lights. I recall, while a student at the University of Missouri, that power went off at midnight every night. A warning switch was always given shortly before it was cut off. Being an only child, Ray always had an air of responsibility about him. He was a serious, competent, and inquisitive person. He was a stickler for obeying the rules and expected others to do the same. As a boy, I observed my father and mother going out occasionally to attend lodge. This didn't mean anything to me except that they did certain things behind closed doors which they were not supposed to be given outside and they had passwords and signs and the like. This prompted me to want to organize some sort of a boys lodge and thus early in life I became an organizer. My first attempt was assisted by my mother who believed in the better things in life and so I organized a secret group of the better boys in the neighborhood under the name of ACC. Membership was paid in pins, which was a staple product of the day. We had a small initiation ceremony, and the secret name here cropped out. It was a promise not to smoke cigarettes, which in those days made men and boys tubercular and not fit to go about with respectable people. The secret name of the organization was Anti-Cigarette Crusade, and I was president. As for the ACC, it passed out when I moved from Spickard, and if there are any effects from it ever having existed there, they are not visible. 
and the town to the naked eye. Ray's humor is showing up here, says most farmers and small town residents in the 1940s smoke. This was kind of this. At least I had done my bit. I kept my obligation about not smoking for the remainder of my life. Of course, children of all generations enjoy bathroom humor, so that a suction on bath bathroom outhouses never fails to entertain us. Ray begins that section by saying, the gay 90s were not the days of sanitation as we know them today. Spickard had no sewer system except that provided by nature, and nature was never generous. <laughs> the only water we had in our home was a well, which was in the back porch, as required the pumping of water in the daytime, putting it in large tubs and buckets. When necessary, some of it was heated to a temperature the body could stand. Then you stood in the tub or sat in the chair and took your bath. It's hard to imagine Ray's early years had no cars and literally no real roads. He writes, Spickard was on a trail which extended down from Iowa into Missouri. It was not much of a trail and absolutely impassable during the winter months, but good enough for people who were traveling westward in search of free land the government had offered to those who would homestead. Spickard was fortunate enough to have at the railroad tracks running through town Ray commented that even though Spickard was not a scheduled stop, his father knew all the conductors and could get the train to stop to pick up anybody he wanted. The tracks, only a block from his home, provided endless entertainment for Ray and his boyhood friends. They would take pins and lay them crosswise on the tracks to make scissors when the train ran over them. Ray continued, Well do I remember the race for land in Oklahoma. I was just a boy then, and it was back in the 90s. Very often, the homesteaders would camp near Spickard, and it is recorded that on many occasions the nearby farmers lost their chickens or other livestock during this temporary occupancy. Then there were the so-called gypsies, who traveled via covered wagons. Upon their arrival in town, they would set out from the house to tell house to house to tell fortunes, or from store to store to beg for money. And those who admitted them to their homes very often suffered the loss of some prized possession or even money. They were always dressed in loud colored clothes with many spangles around their necks or on their arms. As a child, I was cautioned about being around loose on the street when gypsies were about, for they were accused of stealing small children. And while I wondered what a gypsy would do with me, nevertheless, it seemed to be a worry to my parents. So what did Ray do in this small town? Obviously, his church was one of the social, well, church was one, obviously one of the social pillars of the community, and his parents were very active in the Methodist church. They had both been school teachers at different times in their lives, so we can only assume that their level of education led to lay leadership positions in the church. So, if you're one of the leaders, much of your life revolved around the church. But for a young boy, church was kind of a drag. There was nothing gloomier to me as a boy than Sunday in Spickard. To begin with, it was a very small town and no amusements of any kind. The program for the day was usually Sunday school at the three churches, Methodist, Christian, and Baptist, followed by church, which occupied the time of the townspeople until 12 or 12.30, according to the length of the preacher's address. Then all went home and dinner was prepared. Then things shut up tight for the rest of the afternoon. Then came the Epworth League at 6.30, and this was followed by regular church at 7.30 and on until bedtime. By the time I had endured all these services throughout the day and night, I had put in a day's effort. <laughs> then, during the week, there was always prayer meeting and choir practice, and it so happened I was always taken along, for it seemed to be dangerous to leave me at home. When Easter Sunday came along, many of the boys would ramble up the railroad tracks and boil eggs and otherwise cavort. But not Ray B. Denslow. His place was at home. Then came the day we moved away from Spickard. I was then 14. We moved to Macon, Missouri. While my parents knew the local Methodist minister, they were not as active in the church as they had been in Spickard. I acquired some new friends in the Blees Boys, and they were constantly beseeching my parents to permit me to go places with them on Sunday. I was happy to comply and finally drifted away from all the church services. The moral, as I see it, 
is not to insist upon a young child going too often to church services which are uninteresting and above their heads. Religion is not something which should have to be taken, but something one should want. In contrast to the dull church services were the celebrations of the 4th of July and reunions. Let's let Ray tell it. Spickard boasted of two annual events which were always brought to crowds of people from far and near. One was the 4th of July celebration and the other was the soldiers reunion, the latter occurring in late August. In almost every case, these celebrations were held on what was called the reunion grounds, belonging to old Judge Spickard and located about a half a mile west of town. Incidentally, the dirt roads by the time these events were over were a mass of dust and clouds of dust followed every wagon going and coming from the grounds. I vividly remember one celebration with a parade. I had a new bicycle, and Mother had made me a 4th of July suit consisting of a red blouse with white collar and stars and pants that alternated red and white stripes. I was, I was, going, and I was going fine until it rained. The fabric that was guaranteed not to run did so, and when I took off my clothes after the parade, I was the most beautifully marked specimen you have ever seen. <laughs> the reunion was an annual gathering of old soldiers, for Spickard had the largest post in the county. People camped out, driving in for miles and miles away. At both celebrations, there were always carnival attractions, merry-go-rounds, ferris wheels, lemonade stands, cane racks, and the like. At the north end of the grounds, a platform was erected with seats, and here candidates for political office proclaimed their wares. No celebration of any consequence in the days from 1890 to 1910 was complete without a balloon ascension and the accompanying parachute leap. This was usually the climax to the afternoon program and was always withheld until the end to keep the country folks to the end and thereby get their last dollar. The ascent was made by a professor, whatever his name happened to be, Usually the professor was some scraggly looking specimen in a pair of faded tights. The balloon would be laid out in an open place while the admiring public surrounded it, watching every act. A fire was built in the ground and occasionally buckets of gasoline were thrown in, causing the balloon to gradually fill until it stood 50 or 60 feet above the crowd. At last, the balloon would rise and gradually drift upward according to the wind. A parachute was hung on the bottom of the balloon, and the man held on to the trapeze. After some five or ten minutes in the air, the professor would cut loose, and the parachute would float down, and all the small boys would set out on a run to see the professor land. The balloon, freed from the weight which had held it upright, would turn upside down, the gas would run out, and the balloon would come to earth. I recall on one occasion, a certain lady of the Trenton Red Light District came to Spickard. She was about half filled with liquor, but instead of making a flight, and, but insisted on making a flight in the balloon. So she was permitted to do so. Her name was Ella Mooney, and the small boys for months afterwards would chant, Ella, Ella Mooney, she went up in a balloon. Ella, Ella Mooney. <laughs> Later, I saw balloon ascensions in Macon and other places, and other places, and the novelty never grew old. There was always some excitement about it, especially when some professor would get entangled with one of the guy ropes. On these occasions of the fourth and reunions, my parents kept open house for all the relatives from everywhere. Trains ran from Trenton and Princeton, and some seven or eight thousand people on the grounds was no exception. The family moved to Macon in uh, 1899, where his father had been employed as an editor of the newspaper. Here he graduated from Macon High School and attended the newly opened Lee's Military Academy. From the day he reached his majority, Freemasonry was the love of Ray Genslow. At the time of his initiation in Censor Lodge No. 182 in Macon, he was undoubtedly the youngest Mason in the country. The Lodge met on the evening of March 5th, 1906, and one minute after midnight, voted on and gave him his entered apprentice degree. Several Missouri newspapers carried stories on it, and a month later, on April 14th, 06, he was raised to the Master Mason degree in Twilight Lodge 114. In Columbia, he demitted from Macon in uh, 1910 and is affiliated with uh, Trenton Lodge 111 on May 6th of that year, 
where he remained until his death. Ray attended the University of Missouri, where he graduated from the Arts and Science with an A.B. degree in 1907. Ray married his wife, Clara, uh, on his graduation day at MU. While in the university, he earned extra money as a photographer, a trade he learned from his father. He was a classmate of the novelist Homer Croy, and both were considered by Dr. Walter Williams, founder of the School of Journalism and later university president, to be among the first graduates of the journalism school. Ray, Croy, and Merrill Otis, who was a federal judge in Kansas City, often laughed. Their English professor had failed them all at least once. <laughs> the family had a textbook that Croy borrowed from Ray in 1907. In the front of the volume was an elaborately inscribed pledge to return the volume promptly, signed by witnesses with a seal. In 1957, 50 years later, Croy returned the volume. <laughs> the local newspaper carried an unscrib on it, which was picked up by the Christian Science Monitor, who ran an editorial on the subject of borrowing books. He must have developed a taste for orderliness and familiarity with the military, while well, at Lee's Military Academy. For the university, he became a member of the Corps of Cadets, and at graduation was adjutant of the Corps. While in Columbia, he became a chapter charter member of the Acacia Fraternity, a national fraternity open to Master Masons. They had no house at that time and few activities. Following graduation in the Postal Service in Macon, uh, he entered the Postal Service in Macon. Soon after that, Ray and his parents returned to Trenton in 1909, and Ray became a clerk carrier in Grundy County. He also frequently helped out his father, who published the Trenton Daily News. In 1920, Ray organized the second chapter of DeMolay in Trenton. The founder, Frank S. Land, had started the first chapter in Kansas City. Ray accepted the position of National Supervisor of DeMolay in 1921, which required that he move to Kansas City, where he traveled throughout the country organizing several hundred new chapters of the new organization. He was one of the first recipients of the Legion of Honor in 1924. Ray was initiated into the Scottish Rite in St. Louis in 1917, and in 1935 he was coroneted a 33rd degree honorary of that right. Sovereign Grand Commander for many years was John Cowles. Ray and John did not get along well. Ray thought the Scottish Rite was a hierarchy in which its members had no voice. He was both local, vocal and verbose over these misgivings. In fact, he left John Cowles with little other choice than to do something which may never have had a precedent in the history of Scottish Rite. He took away Ray's 33rd degree from him. But revenge was sweet, not long in coming either. When Harry Truman became president, the Scottish Rite wished to confer the 33rd degree on President Truman. Harry Truman told John Cowles, not until you give Ray Denslow back his. So John Cowles gave him back his degree, but Ray had taken off his 33rd degree ring and never wore it again. Ray and Harry were friends from the time Mr. Truman was a Jackson County judge. They became acquainted, of course, through masonry. When Truman was in the Grand Lodge line, there was a movement to remove him because of his ties to the Pendergast machine. Ray went to bat for him, and Truman won out. Truman sent my father an autographed picture of himself on which he wrote, Bill, your father was a friend when I needed one. Truman often introduced Ray as my damn Republican friend. <laughs> One of our favorite memories from childhood was our unexpected and uninvited meeting with President Truman and Grandpa Ray. In 1950, while Truman was president, the Shrine held a gala banquet for him at the Mule Bog. Three generations of Denslows went to Kansas City and were happily ensconced in the Mule Bog with those newfangled things called TVs in each room. With the TV for entertainment, our father decided that it would be safe to leave Danny and me in the room without a babysitter. He cautioned us that we were not to leave the room. As could have been predicted, the TV turned to garbled snow in about two minutes after our parents left the hotel room. So, of course, we opened the door and began wandering the hallways. And what could possibly be more entertaining for two young country bumpkins than TVs? Elevators. <laughs> so on we jumped. 
and we began pushing all the buttons we could reach. As luck would have it, we accidentally found our way to the presidential suite during the social hour prior to dinner. When the elevator doors opened, we were promptly met by the Secret Service, who naively turned us around and sent us back down. This was such a good time, we tried it again. <laughs> this time, upon arrival at the President's Suite, someone asked, Who are these pajama-clad urchins? And the reply came, The Dinslow children! <laughs> Summoned, Grandpa Ray proudly gathered us in and took us to meet President Truman, who pulled two brand new $1 bills from his pocket and autographed them for us. We still have them. <laughs> Mine's in a frame. <laughs> Then our father, notified of the uninvited guests, less proudly escorted us back to the hotel room. If you have ever been in the military, you have heard swear words. And if you are the disobedient children of Bill Denslow, you have heard swear words too. <laughs> it is, however, truly a night that Denny and I have never forgotten. And over the years, at many cocktail parties, it's made a darn good story. Ray made several trips to Europe to promote worldwide Freemasonry. In 1936, he made his first European trip, visit to the British Isles and Scandinavia. He was gone a month and a half and had dinner with many noted persons. He related his dinner with King Gustav of Sweden as follows. If anyone had told me during the month of October that I should dine with a king during the month of November, I should have regarded him as being out of his mind. And yet on the evening of November 20th, 1936, I sat down to dinner with King Gustav V of Sweden in the banquet hall at the great castle in Stockholm. In Sweden, the king or some member of the royal family has been for centuries the grand master or protector of the Masonic fraternity. The present King Gustav V is the present grand master of the Grand Lodge of Sweden. The Masonic fraternity in Sweden, knowing of the approaching bicentenary ceremonies of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, and the probable attendance of many American representatives conceived the idea of extending the invitation to all the Grand Lodges recognized by them to come by way of Stockholm. Upon our arrival in Stockholm, we discovered the presence of the fast the, of five past Grand Masters, four current Grand Masters from throughout the U.S., and two representatives from the Grand Lodge of Norway. At 7.45, we left the Masonic Temple, where we had just witnessed the king conferring the eighth degree to 12 candidates in an elaborate ceremony given in English for our benefit. We were conducted past the servants and guards galore, most of them in impressive colors, livery of their sovereign. As we attended up the steps to the upper floors of the palace, we were directed to a dressing room where coats and top hats were placed on racks. On to another room, and we lined up in a semicircle, and in a moment the king stepped out, followed by a young man in his mid-thirties. Both passed around the semicircle, shaking hands and their, with their guests and speaking a word to them. The young man I later discovered to be his grandson, Gustavius Adolphus, son of King Crown Prince, who was at the time visiting England. The king followed, made us to follow him, and we passed through a number of palatial apartments and into the banquet hall, which you see. A charming scene met the eye. It was a room probably 100 feet long and 60 feet wide. Large columns supported the roof. The sides of the wall were covered with tapestries and panes. In the center of the room was a great banquet table, probably 50 feet long and 8 feet wide. Down the center was placed immense pieces of silver, masterpieces of the silversmith's art. I learned that they had been given the royal family many years ago by Dom Pedro of Brazil, a relative of the king. Flowers covered the table in profusion. Silver and gold dishes completed the table service. The king sat halfway down the table. The American guests were all about the table, separated by Swedish brethren. Behind the king stood his personal servant. There also appeared to be one waiter for each guest. All were in brilliant uniform embroidered with a royal crest. The menu cards contained the royal crest in gold. One of the courses on the menu was elk meat, which was said that the elk was the one which had been killed by the king, he being a great sportsman. When the meal was completed, the king arose, passed out of the room, followed his guests. We returned to the trophy room, a room of large dimensions containing several Davenports, chairs, 
pool table and other accessories, the walls being covered with hundreds of horns and heads, trophies of the chase. Each shield had marked upon it a place where the animal had been killed and the date. Cigars and cigarettes were passed out. The king was very informal. He smoked cigarettes, sat at the edge of the pool table, conversed and attempted to make all of his guests feel at home. At precisely 9.55 p.m., the king proceeded to leave the room, and the guests followed soon thereafter. For your information, uh, to give you a sense of uh, the ambience of such meals, I have sp had spoken with the most worshipful brother, uh, Thomas. Jones, I'm sorry, Jones, about arranging for fancy silver centerpieces and a waiter to be positioned behind each of your chairs for breakfast. <laughs> Unfortunately, he said the budget would not permit it. And here's, here's the flowers he gave us. <laughs> Less than a week later, Ray attended a similarly formal in installation of the Duke of York as the Grand Master of Scotland. As he related in his notes to us, my first sight of the Duke was when he was ushered in by bagpipes at Usher Hall to be installed as Grand Master Mason. He sat ten feet away from me. Later at the dinner, given in the castle, we were all introduced to him. That same evening, he was at the Music Hall, and later we were again introduced to him at the Lord Mayor's Chambers in the Sea Hall of Edinburgh. Ten days later, the brother abdicated the throne, and the Duke of York became King George VI of England, through which ascension he was compelled to relinquish his duties as Grand Master Mason and became Grand Patron of the Order. Ray was passionate about masonry around the world and worked tirelessly to rebuild the lodges in many countries and to promote unity, recognition, and communication among them. He visited Europe twice following World War II as a representative of the Masonic Service Association to evaluate, report, and support the rebuilding of the lodges in Europe that had been destroyed by the Nazis. President Truman was instrumental in supporting and facilitating these visits. <coughs> Judy and I have mused over the year how a small town boy from Missouri ended up in such an important position in state, national, and international masonry. Ray's parents undoubtedly set a good example for him with their community involvement, understanding of moral character. Perhaps being an only child gave Ray an abundance of self-confidence. He was a meticulous documenter of everything he saw and did. This trait may have trained him to have a better overview of a situation and that he could review his notes rather than simply relying on his memory of an event. It allowed him to be able to document these events through his writings and minutes. He was also a big fish in a small pond. Masonry was only a small piece of the historical, social, and political makeup of the currents playing out on the world stage. But his devotion to the craft from a young age allowed him to have knowledge of masonry that others would spend years to acquire. He was indeed a world-class expert in this specific field, and perhaps therein lies the answer. He was entirely devoted to masonry. It was his vocation and his application. Ray wrote an essay, in which, is a, which is also contained in the second volume, called 100 Years. In it, he summarizes the prior 100 years as only a second in time compared with the centuries of human achievement. His summary may be the appropriate way to inspire you this morning. Quote, and to the next 100 years. Well, it is my opinion that the future will depend on what we do here, now, and during those years which are to follow. If there is a place in Royal Arch Masonry in the tomorrow, then there will be a Royal Arch Masonry. If we convert our institution into a dining club, if we meet only for the purpose of conferring degrees, if we elect for our officers men who have no vision of brotherhood, the future of our duties to the community, then we can expect little in the years to come. However, if we fit ourselves into the community life of our home city, if we make men better, if we practice brotherhood, which we so glibly teach, if we confer our degrees in a manner to press home the teaching of the degree, if we elect men of vision to head our chapters, then the subordinate chapters will furnish the grand chapter with strong leadership. Under that leadership, Royal Arch Masonry will move forward in the future as it has in the past. To take its place among the forefront of fraternal organizations in this country, and we may continue to declare proudly, I am a Royal Arch Mason. Thank you.
I know we're on short time here, but a couple of things. These two books that have been written are also available on Kindle. And they're on Kindle at a very cheap price. If uh, you are interested in reading, um, these books are there and they are wonderful. One thing that we need to talk about we did not yesterday is we have a wonderful newsletter that Bright Works for Brother Lloyd Lyon has produced and shares with us. Lloyd, are you in the room? Uh, we need to make sure that we can get it to him and he can get it to you electronically. Um, if you don't have email addresses in the Mental Missouri Lodge of Research or in the database, please do so because this newsletter is very, very, very interesting. Lots of history in it. And Lloyd has done a fine job and I think you'll be very appreciative of it. I know we are at short time. Um, Stan is sitting here with a twinkle in his eye and we'll see how much he's twinkling in about 365 days. <laughs> but no, it's uh, an exciting time and, and I know that uh, Most Worship Brother Tim is trying to get ready to go, as are we, so I don't have anything else. Um, anything else, Brother Secretary? No, you're good. Okay. Uh, then I will ask for everybody to please rise and ask Brother Jim P. to give us a benediction as we do. Words to live by. Dear Heavenly Father, as we travel through life, may our guide, God guide our words and actions. May our God be alive in our hearts. May our God shed light as we watch our thoughts, they become words. Watch our words, they become choice. Watch our choices, they become actions. Watch our actions, they become habits. Watch our habits, they become someone's memories. Watch our memories, they become our character. Watch our character, it defines our destiny. Watch our destiny, for it is cradled in the hands of God. May we go with God's peace. Amen. So to thee. Thank you. I would like to bring up Steve Harrison, who is going to do a little bit of an introduction.